Velkommen til min forelæsning. Jeg er glad for at se jer. Jeg skal lige gøre opmærksom på, at der er kamera på, bare sådan I alle ved det. Det filmer jo så mest mig, men øh, bare så I er opmærksom på, at det bliver filmet, og øh, spørgsmål I stiller, vil man jo så også øh, kunne høre på filmen. Jeg havde, øh, har jo et, et hold med internationale studerende, som jeg underviser, så derfor har jeg faktisk forberedt det på engelsk. Og selvom vi muligvis alle taler dansk her, så gennemfører jeg det på engelsk, for min slides er på engelsk. Jeg synes, det var det mest øh, passende at gøre øh, i betragtning af, at jeg synes, de skulle også have muligheden for at finde ud af det. Så so the title of this day's lecture is Critical Innovation Studies. And what I want to discuss is, what does it mean? And why do we need them? Um, when I was invited to do this lecture as part of the open lectures of the department, um, under the overall theme of critical research, I saw this as a great chance to, to revisit some of my own critical research on innovation and more particularly on user-driven innovation in the public sector, where I, in my PhD, conducted what I called a critical philosophical discussion of public sector innovation. I see this chance um, as, uh, I see this as a chance both to try to broaden the idea of critique in relation to the one, the kind of critique that I have conducted, and also to try to raise some critical points um, about my own way of conducting critique in my research. Just to say, I will go into depth with um, my research later, but just to give, us, uh, give you a hint, what I did was I focused on public sector innovation um, as something different from private sector innovation. Um, basically as something which is political rather than commercial, and discussed what that meant for the practices of the public sector when working with innovation. Um, the same about sometimes somehow distancing oneself from the commercial or economic concept of innovation could be said for social innovation and entrepreneurship as something related to social values. Um, so what I did in my research was that I, I did a normative discussion based on certain uh, political philosophical concepts of the public and citizenship and general interest. Uh, from which I discussed innovation practices and innovation concepts in the public sector. What I want to do, or the questions that I want to address, this is rather broad, um, and that is intentional, intentional, because I think that this is the best way for, for op to open for a great discussion of what could critical uh, innovation studies mean? First of all, the question is, if there is such a thing as critical innovation studies, what would then be uncritical innovation studies? Second, was the, what does critique mean? Critique is a very broad concept, and innovation is a very broad concept. So what could critique mean in relation to innovation studies? Why do we need critical innovation studies? And what kind of critical perspectives do we see in the innovation research that we already have? And this, um, I will, you could say, I will, I, can, I will pick certain perspectives and show examples, but I will not give a broad overview of the whole field. That would simply be beyond the scope of this, this lecture. So I point out, in, in particular, two lines of critique that we find in social science and discuss them in relation to innovation studies. The first is what one could call a post-structuralist or post-modernist critical theory in a Foucauldian tradition. And the other one is a Frankfurt School critical theory, uh, mainly here in Habermas's explicit normative uh, critical work. So even though we could say that there is no critical innovation studies 
in, the, in, in terms of a field calling themselves critical innovation studies. It doesn't mean that there are no critical studies of innovation or innovation studies with different kinds of critical approaches. Um, so when I was going to do this, I thought, well, how do I start? And one place where I started was to find inspiration in this field of, or at least one article describing this field of critical management studies, because we have critical management studies as a field which is well established. It was Mats Elveson and Hugh Wilmond who in the 1990s started this and called it critical management studies. And that doesn't mean that there are no other critical studies of management, but they call themselves or their studies this. And we have no equivalent in innovation studies. It's very rare that we find studies that use the term critical by themselves. And that is, I don't have an answer to why that is, but I think it's just quite interesting. Maybe I do, however, have some suggestions. <laughs> um, so if we start with this first question, non-critical innovation studies, and we look, uh, I looked at this article by Fournier and Gray about critical uh, management studies, and they said that non-critical management study is governed by the principle of performativity, which serves to subordinate knowledge and truth to the production of efficiency. Um, and I thought, well, maybe that could also be set to some point, at least to some uncritical innovation studies. Namely, that they would serve what I, or have what I would call a, a more or less technical approach to organizations and management, a technical approach to innovation, rather than, for instance, a political or an ethical approach. Um, and it would also mean somehow a critique of certain mainstream ideas. Um, by the technical approach, I could say that the idea of performativity serving uh, to produce efficiency is something which we also see in quite a lot of approaches to innovation. Another way one could say that one could be critical is to see innovation as what Albrecht calls a term redolent with generally positive resonances. Modern, new, change, improvement, that innovation is just something which is conceived of as an unalloyed good. No one is against innovation. Innovation is just positive in any sense. At least that is the connotations that the, that the concept has. So you could say it is a hurrah word, and that could also explain why no one would call, call themselves critical innovation studies, because we are not against innovation. But critical innovation studies does not necessarily mean that we are against innovation as such. But it may mean that we are against certain ideas of innovation or certain myths about innovation or certain uh, ideological uses of the concept. So in connection to this idea that innovation is something which is just good, which is something we of course want more of in all areas of organizational and societal activities, what we could call uh, a new panacea or a cure-all. Some of the phrases we very often meet in innovation policy texts or, and sometimes also in research is this idea of innovation as a solution to problems that are so complex that we don't know how else to deal with them. Innovation as something which should solve environmental problems, because that's quite difficult to see our ways out of the environmental crisis, to solve great uh, economic financial problems of societies, something which is a solution to welfare uh, problems or serving welfare issues now that we 
cannot rely on the state to the same degree as we thought we could previously. Um, and also this idea that innovation is in all areas of society. Innovation is, can save the economy if companies become competitive and if we have a sufficiently you know, innovative or entrepreneurial workforce that will also um, save the nation in international competition with other nation states. Um, so at least this very broad use of the term gives reasons to be, if not critical, then I don't know, on guard. <laughs> Um, and how does this overly um, over optimism sp spill into innovation theory? Well, first of all, into the main research interest of many, many different innovation theories. Because if innovation is such an unalloyed good, all we want to know is how does innovation occur? What are the barriers and drivers of innovation? Um, so, how do we make innovation happen? But another question is, what is innovation? And what, or what should it be in light of the many different contexts and in light of the many different interests that are connected to the concept? Um, and actually, very large parts of innovation theory and also policy reports have this approach of uncovering barriers and drivers for innovation. So in that sense, innovation is taken for granted. Some innovation is something specific out there that we can measure and we can try to um, promote in ways uh, so that we can, in a way, control organizational life or uh, also society and in particular when innovation becomes a concept which is not only about economic development or economic growth but also about solving welfare problems or solving welfare issues or about the development of the public sector or the third sector it becomes a very very political concept um, so just to to have um, one idea of the most widely used definition, and this is not, this is the OECD definition which builds on Schumpeter's definition of innovation. And if we look at that, we can in a way see that what I would call a technical controlling interest, or technical controlling knowledge constitutive interest with the words of Habermas. Um, of how to make innovation happen and measuring innovation, because this is from the Oslo Manual, which is the definition used to make innovation statistics. And innovation here is def defined as the implementation of a new or considerably improved product, process, marketing method, or a considerable organizational change. It's the result of deliberate plans and activities aimed at improving the company's product processes, sales and marketing or organization. In other words, the concept is linked to improvement. And it's not all researchers that accept that innovation is actually something which leads to improvement because that becomes extremely complex if we say innovation is also, also something which improves the public sector. Then all of a sudden we are into all sorts of different normative ideas of what the public sector is. And I'll return to that because that was actually what I did. Um, but basically, this definition is how, it's how to make organizations perform better at the market, how to survive competition. And even though it's not, many people do question um, the possibilities of transferring this definition into other contexts, such as the public sector. Still, it's very often done, and these kinds of uh, typologies or where you have the products and the services are transferred, direct, transferred directly to the public sector or public sector innovation studies. And that is not 
to the same extent, at least, the case in relation to social innovation. Because social innovation from the very beginning has an idea of social value uh, or creating social value or empowerment or enhance society's uh, capacity to act, which of course uh, suggests other categories to link to the concept of innovation, because innovation in itself is some kind of renewal, but what is renewed, that is the object of change, and whether it's an improvement or not, and all these kinds of things rely on other categories to connect to the, to the concept. One example of um, a definition like this implemented into the public sector is this idea that one of the potential gains of innovation in the public sector is efficiency, effectiveness, and responsiveness. Um, and what I have written here in bold is <laughs> that it's very clear that it is a concept of change and development with practical implications for societal and political arrangements. Because this idea of efficiency, effectiveness, and responsiveness as in a way, the overall values of the public sector are, um, you could say, the, the words coming from a new public management uh, ideology. Because why, and I will also get back to that, why isn't the, the idea to strengthen the democratic processes, the political or democratic legitimacy, and the citizen rights. <laughs> um, so what are the political implications? And that is a question which I would say is a core question to any critical innovation studies. What are the political implications? And I would say that what are the implications in terms of right, justice, or social value? But you can also raise the question without suggestion, suggesting categories like that. Um, and this, of course, is particularly relevant in relation to social innovation and public sector innovation. Um, so just to have something else and just the text, in other words, <laughs> how we define innovation. And when innovation is this broad concept, that we both use in relation to the public sector, to social innovation, and to market innovation or economic innovation, then it has to do with the boundaries and the way that the tasks divided to civil society, to the public sector and the, and, and the market, and how we define the, you could say, core values or core activities within these different spheres, as I see it. So this was my initial reflections about what is, in general, on critical innovation studies and what is critical innovation studies. Then, and critical innovation studies tend to, to raise certain questions, but there are also different ways to approach this in a research way. And here I suggested that I would look at two different um, social science um, methods or kinds of critique, so to say. First of all, this idea of critique as uh, genea genealogy, taken from Foucault. Um, and this approach could be a way to see innovation not as something given. That is, it's not necessarily defined in a certain way. It's not necessarily a certain kind of change that we want and that we want more of and that we can just measure in a way and make statistics over without it having any influence on how society is organized. Um, by making a discourse analysis or a genealogy of uh, innovation, we could see innovation not as something given, but rather as something which is historically contingent and formed by certain powers and interests. Um, thereby revealing the power dimensions of innovation ideas or ideologies, um, even though I'm not sure that Foucault would call them ideologies. But it could be a similar approach if you made an ideology critique in another tradition, as I see it. 
So it could be a study of the descent of categories or how they have developed and how they have gained dominance. And actually, I've, I have found um, a series of working papers working with making this uh, history, history of ideas, of concepts, of innovation by uh, the researcher Benoit Cotin. Um, and he has a lot of, he has a whole series of research papers. And I look particularly into one which was about innovation as a category more generally, and another one about the development of the idea of social innovation. And some of the interest, there were many interesting insights, but some of them um, that I have um, listed here is that the, the, the first paper, innovation, by looking at it this way, it shows it's a much broader category than a just economic or technological concept, which is dominant today. And I think it, we can all agree that when we think of innovation, we think of it in terms of this uh, te technological or economic innovations, and we think of Schumpeter as the father of innovation theory. But the concept goes way back um, and has had many different shifting meanings throughout history. So innovation is not necessarily just this economic concept. So we may actually use the concept in other ways. And, and in my research, I sometimes, when I was discussing the, the concept of innovation in relation to the public sector, of course, sometimes I, I asked myself why I would hold on to the concept at all, if it really was this technical controlling, <laughs> uh, almost neoliberal or economistic concept, why would I not just throw it away and say, well, we need to call it something else. But actually, because there are, there, there may be potentials in the concept of innovation um, that do not restrict it to being this kind of concept. It could be another kind of renewal, a kind of transgression, a kind of change which, bring, which brings about something, of course, building on already existing components components, but something which is new and perhaps more just or a better, um, you could say, societal order. And the second thing was that I thought was interesting was that innovation has not always been considered as something which was just positive. Before the French Revolution, an innovator, a social innovator, was seen as a religious or political revolutionary and not necessarily uh, as someone wanted in society or some, someone doing something that was considered to be positive. So, and I think that is quite interesting to see how some of these strong connotations that the concept have today um, are, of course, um, emerged in certain times and for certain reasons. Um, I just want to, to mention that even this, even though I see this as a way of conducting critique, he does not himself call it a critical appro approach, and it's not, he, he doesn't have any uh, radical critique or any critical aims as such. I think he's more is trying to explore the concept but I'm just thinking that in light of critical research, these are interesting findings. Because it opens up for trying to actually s say, well, we can decide what we want to do with the concept. And it's something that we can actually also discuss. The critical move, as I see it, um, lies here in creating a distance from the practices that we're living and dispelling their origins as contingent, uh, in contingent historical circumstances, I, as I said, um, and thereby treating them as the outcome of multiple relations of force. So the way we see innovation today and the way it's defined in, poli in policy or in research uh, 
is something which are um, the outcome of these relations of force. And that is a denaturalization of innovation, which is then not something specific out there that we can find and measure, but something that we actually need to be aware of how we define and also what are the practical implications and the, you could say, real consequences of defining it in certain ways. Um, so it also reveals that we, in a way, promote certain, when we promote certain ideas of development um, or certain ideas of development may be implied in specific ideas of innovation. And here I have this example of managerialism, anti-bureaucracy and competition. Because innovation, one thing is the we have a definition and that is just a, a short sentence of this is how it is defined. But very often there are some specific myths or stories connected to the innovation concept. And that is that of course, innovation is something that is supposed to make companies more competitive. And the way that they become more competitive is by being uh, not bureaucratic, by being lean and flat, uh, by letting managers rule, because managers are bearers of real life wisdom. Um, and if we let them decide, then um, they will find the best solutions because they are close to where it happens. And these certain ideas of development have in particular um, had consequences of the public sector and also of the way we think of innovation in the public sector as something which should necessarily get rid of bureaucracy because bureaucracy makes a public sector inefficient. And there are many reasons and it's very easy to be against bureaucracy because it's criticized from, you could say, both um, the left and the right for being f creating alienation, for being rigid, for not hearing the voices of people. But in a way, it's you could say you could discuss whether it's in the public sector also sometimes important and necessary in order to ensure equal treatment, due process, um, and what role bureaucracy has in the protection of citizen rights. I'm not saying that this is the only way, just that if we completely neglect it, something else is also forgotten or lost. Um, um, so, this is my last slide about this critical approach, critique as genealogy. Um, that this kind of critique can change our self-understanding um, and our, standing, our understanding of society we live in and thereby have impl implications for practice. Even though uh, it can show that certain ideas constrain human life or that innovation makes us blind to certain aspects of human life, at least when we define it in certain ways, but it doesn't really necessarily suggest other categories or other ways of seeing it. And that is the purpose of this kind of critique, that the, the critique of reason, the critique of these categories and the normative power they have is radical. So instead of falling into just suggesting other powerful concepts which can be used for all sorts of ideological purposes, um, this kind of critique in a way points to the idea that innovation is imbued with power um, and we can elucidate the power relations and reveal them, but we don't suggest an alternative as such. Um, and I think that to distinguish this kind of critique from the normatively informed critique that I will uh, present in a moment, that Judith Butler, even though she's very critical to the normatively informed critique, um, in her distinction, distinction between critique and judgment, point to some very important differences in the way these two kinds of critiques look at, um, you could say, find, define how critique can be um, as emancipatory in a way, 
creating em emancipatory potential to the greatest extent. She distinguishes between crit critique, which is what she says, critique is what Foucault does, and also actually Adorno, and judgment is what she categorizes uh, Habermas's critical approach as. Uh, she says that this, the distinction or the distinction extracts critique as something that suspends judgment uh, and offers a new practice uh, of value based on that very suspension. And judgment, on the other hand, is a way to subsume a particular under an already constituted category, whereas critique asks for the occlusive con constitution of the field of categories themselves. Um, and in that sense, I think, it's, I think it's very interesting the way that he describes judgment as we have some categories and then we measure the real world or we measure empirical world against them. And that doesn't sound very sympathetic in a way. I can understand why in a, that it sounds much more sympathetic to leaving the alternatives open in that sense. Because otherwise, you may, as I said, suggest other categories which, which are also imbued with power and, and everything. But on the other hand, you could say that even the negativistic or non-normative critiques have an utopian component. Um, and it's very difficult to see how these critiques could make analysis of pathologies without at least implying a better world or a better society or something uh, which is better and, and different from what we have now. Um, so I could say that a critical theory of society is unthinkable without a more or less specific idea of the good society or at least a better society. And otherwise these uh, societal anomalies uh, the analysis would be without ethical reason. There would be really no normative reason to work towards improving the existing conditions. Um, and in a way, you could say this idea of suggesting categories, you can take it to either you can just suggest them or you can go all the way and really suggest them and discuss what they will mean. In that sense, you could say social innovation in many different, often is a critique of the economic aspects of innovation, and they, definitions of social innovation suggest these other categories. Empowerment, that innovation that is social in both its means and ends, that it leads to well-being or collective autonomy. Um, so it does have a critical edge, clearly. But then I say, does it take it all the way through? Because I haven't seen that many texts that really go into depth with and discuss what does empowerment mean, what does collective autonomy mean, and how do we see it in empirical examples, and discuss empirical examples critically, and not just taking for granted that because something perhaps looks as if it creates social value, that social value is, is really complex and is something which can be defined on different dimensions, and defining it in terms of well-being or in terms of collective or political autonomy is very, very different. And in terms of taking seriously that critical research has an emancipatory aim or is trying to uh, find out how do we um, work in ways that uh, suggest the best ways of emancipation, then sometimes this re could really mean a difference to the solutions. Um, and what I have done is, as I said, try to take it all the way through. And that is something which, of course, can also be criticized. So I will um, now tell you about my um, PhD study and only about the empirical part of it. I did, um, as I said, a study of user-driven innovation practices in 
uh, public organization and authority, the Ministry of Taxation. And they had back then an innovation office, and they worked with user-driven innovation in many different ways. Um, I did, I defined concepts of citizenship in terms of rights. I defined the, you could see, say normative constitutive conditions of the public sector as, you could say, working towards the common good or general interest and securing uh, citizen rights. Um, and then I also defined a certain idea of general interest as something which is constituted in deliberative democratic processes. So I actually had some quite specific and well-defined categories to discuss my empirical case against. I did 14 interviews about the way that they did user-driven innovation. And they were very uh, interested in being this, what they call actually customer-friendly authority. They had been quite heavily influenced by the rhetorics of new public management. Um, so they called the citizens uh, customers, and they did customer satisfaction surveys. And they did different kinds of user-driven innovation uh, activities where they involved the citizens as users and the way they described the citizens and what they were aiming to learn about was the experiences, the service experience of the citizens, what they called the moment of truth, which is a concept taken from marketing. That is where uh, it, it, the moment where the value is truly created or where it really matters. It was also the experience of due process um, and also the feelings that citizens had when they encountered the authority. Um, and so in that sense, I categorized their approach as a service approach where they had a very individualistic in a way and very particularistic idea of the citizens as someone with feelings and, and that was very much because they wanted to distance, distance themselves from this idea of petty bureaucracy and clientization and a bureaucracy or an authority that didn't care about how the citizens felt and were afraid that they would feel alienated. And I could say this is, this is a reasonable concern. But what made it, what was very difficult with the way they approached the citizens and the way they thought about innovation and the public, the, their, the authority as such, made it very difficult for them to incorporate the concerns about citizen rights and due process and about serving all citizens in equal ways. It was very difficult for them. It was very difficult for them to transform the insights from the innovation projects into something which could provide better services for all, so to say. Because it's highly law, regu law regulated and the citizens in a way are, have a very uh, <laughs> juridical or legal um, relationship to this authority. So it's very difficult to, to see them as these particular persons. N nevertheless, actually, I would say some of the, this is one example of they also wanted to be an authority at eye level. So they have this Twitter profile called Skedifar. And the idea here is to get closer to young people who have difficulties understanding the vocabulary of the whole taxation thing. Um, so I discussed to what extent actually their approach was problematic in order for them to be a good, a better public authority and in what sense it actually did make sense. And I didn't, you could say I did a discussion and of course I came to some conclusions, um, but I also through that exercise of discussing this came to the conclusion that rights, that what does a citizen, what do citizen rights matter if the citizens feel so alienated? 
that they cannot execute their own right to due process because they are afraid to raise complaints. They don't know the rules. So in that sense, these ways of trying to inform citizens, get closer to them, was also a way of strengthening their right to due process because the citizens would actually try to engage in their own tax matters. They would try to understand. And that is a precondition for saying that rights are actually effective. But still, I suggested that they could think of citizens in a more also collective way. They could easily, they shouldn't be afraid of seeing themselves as an authority because what happened otherwise was that the power was something that they had great power, but it was something that we just want to be friendly. <laughs> so it's better not in a way just to not to mention it. And that it was quite difficult because they actually, they were very much aware of their role as public authority, but the concepts of innovation and the methods that they found from consultancy business and from the developed within private sector contexts worked very, it was very difficult for them and it was very difficult for them to somehow translate it into a vocabulary or into public sector categories. Um, so, this was all. The analysis in that way showed a gap between the idea of being a public authority and the innovation practices that should make them a better public authority. Um, and I only have, I'm finished in, in just a little while. Um, what I did, as I mentioned, was to discuss what this means for the public organizations' ability to be an authority. And I, with, in a way, it was a more general discussion of how could we think of innovation in the public sector in light of that they, you know, in a certain sense, all relate to citizens, even though in very different ways. And they, in that sense, all have some, you could say, general obligation, which is not just providing individual satisfaction or fulfilling preferences. Um, and I suggested more collectively uh, oriented or deliberative methods that also reaches beyond the private world of the citizen. But as I said, doesn't neglect that actually the experience and feelings when encountering an authority can be central in uh, having rights which are effective. Um, what I ended up with was uh, a suggestion for a new definition. And I would say when I started my PhD in 2008 in Denmark, there wasn't that much research and that much, much discussion of how to define public sector innovation. And now it's much more advanced and there are many different good approaches uh, and, and very good definitions of innovation that reaches beyond this uh, commercial idea. But I suggested that public sector innovation could refer to new practices of public sector organizations that strengthen their capacity to deal with common political concerns and citizen rights. Um, what I would say methodologically is that even though I would suggest this as a researcher, it would be meant as open for discussion, however, in a normative and systematic way. Um, because the way that I have defined this is on the basis of political philosophy from Hannah Arendt, from Habermas, from Kent, um, and so forth. So I have actually, dis I have discussed these concepts quite systematically and they are inscribed in a certain field of research which has as its aim to define and discuss these concepts. Um, and thus we could understand or discuss whether this or a certain understanding of citizenship or publicness would have the most, you could say, emancipatory implications. So I wouldn't say that citizenship should only be understood in this way, but I would still say that I would dare to suggest that this could be a way of um, 
defining it. Some could cr criticize um, this approach by saying that it is detached or distancing uh, the researcher from the persons under study <laughs> in a way that I'm objectifying them and their understandings of reality, uh, that by bringing my own norms in as standards, that it's a very external critique, st standards taken that I suggest rather than standards suggested by the actors in the field themselves or the participants, um, that I thereby take the role of expert by formulating these concepts rather than departing in the ideas and values or everyday life or the utopian ideas of uh, the actors or participants of the study themselves. Um, some could even, even though I would never say they suffer from full consciousness, but if you read between the lines and, and if you really wanted to be rough on me, maybe you could say that I am saying that they're imposed to this colonization of an NPM agenda or they are so entangled in their business vocabulary that they become completely blind and also almost suffer from false consciousness, even though that was not what I suggested. I was not blaming them. I was, in a way, blaming researchers and the field for not having imagination enough to come up with better concepts and methods of user inclusion. But of course, they could have looked at other kinds of citizen involvement, which were not called innovation, and they would have found many different ways to work with citizens. But that is, when it's called innovation, then all of a sudden it's, it seems as if it gets, the, it gets uh, attached to certain categories and ways of thinking, um, rather than others. Um, in conclusion, um, what can critique do? These two different ways. It can elucidate uh, the contingency and power relations attached to certain ideas and discourses of innovation, show pathologies uh, or maybe something wrong with innovation. Um, for example, that a dominant techno-economic paradigm of innovation would support economism, neoliberalism or market ideology rather than democracy and collect collective action, which is in a way what I suggested in my research. Uh, critique can, but does not necessarily have to, suggest other categories, either just suggest them or actually discuss these normative definitions and implications more systematically and really trying to take it all the way through. But that, of course, also makes you open to critique and makes you, in a way, a bit vulnerable as a researcher because you really put yourself at stake. Uh, and maybe that is why we don't see any more really throwing themselves into enga engaging in these normative discussions of what is social value in relation to uh, social innovation and what is the difference between increasing well-being and increasing political autonomy um, of people in society, for instance. And lastly, rather than just define the categories um, yourself. The, the categories could also be defined um, together with the participants in more participatory and action research oriented um, approaches or methodologies. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll put, take it back to the first slide because I forgot a thank you slide. <laughs> and it's so weird with the last one. Yeah? Uh, should we have a break or should we just have discussions, questions right away? You can also say it short the desk. Yeah, you have a question. That was really, really interesting. I learned a lot actually for a study director of a program working with these things, I actually learned a lot in the last hour, really a lot. <laughs> and of course, I'm, I'm no wiser than I was <laughs> before you started, but quite inspired. And my, my approach to, or my entry point for this discussion is through development studies. And then, you know, I'd like to just hold on to the word development, because I see a lot of similarities with the word development.
and the word innovation. And the other entry point is, is our own master program, the candidate program. But with, with development, that, the critique of development as in, as in Ludwig and his arbeiter, totally that means um, development in the, in the so-called South. The critique of that was both by critical theorists who saw it as, 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 as embodying dominant interests and you know, northern European concerns and so forth, and therefore it was, it was structured to maintain but legitimize inequalities. The post-structuralist response was to say there was no way out of the word. But the word embodied a certain worldview and a certain set of processes that development was the problem. So where the critical theorists look for um, alternative development, the post-structuralists would say you've got to find an alternative to development because development has built into it a lot of the impulses of Western or modern Western rational um, society and that's the problem. So I, wonder, I just wonder, my first question would be, is innovation just the dirty word? That's just the wrong word and we'll always be trapped if we keep using the word innovation. We may try to fill it out with social innovation and therefore explicitly focus on something that's much more than, say, economics or managerial or whatever, but it's nevertheless already compromised by being associated with innovation. So yes, there may be some moderate room for change and, and the uh, progress towards the good life and well-being or whatever, but it's constrained. And the last 30 years of, of social life will just constrain that even more as, as neoliberalism has become much, much deeper around the system. So one thing is innovation, is this a good point of departure, especially for a university like Rook, to be done with innovation and start working on another terminology? Doesn't mean we don't have that commitment to change and so forth, but we're trapped with that term. But that's, that's coming from development studies, my, my interest there. And then with our own, our own SEM program, our, our social enterprise program, it, it just made me think that we start with this module that's very broad, introducing students to different ways of understanding entrepreneurialism, the social, and so forth. Then there's a, mo a module on innovation, but primarily social innovation. That's good. That sort of fits with what you were saying earlier, that you know, critical innovation studies hardly exist, but it, it exists in, in effect as social innovation. Right? So it's there, but it's just not part of the mainstream discourse. It's already marginalized. All the good work by the good colleagues is already being done outside the big, you know, where the big decisions are being made. And it's called social innovation. It doesn't mean it's not important, but it's already marginalized. But in our third module, it seems like we fall into this trap of then legitimating the focus on management and accounting and finance. And we bring all those things to the center. Having had this radical social innovation approach, we too get trapped. In the, in the prevailing discourse of innovation from Shanta and Shanta to others of looking at these things in economic and managerialist terms. So I wondered even how our program that has a quite a radical ambition mm -hmm. is a good example of the problem and therefore the challenge of trying to break away from that mainstream, the mainstream dominating view of social change as, as, uh, through, the, through the optique of innovation. Yeah. That's a long question. That was a long one. I think you had two questions. <laughs> the first one. I don't think innovation, I really thought about <laughs> if innovation is the wrong word. Um, and I don't think it is. And I already, s I do already see it's there is a com there is competition for trying to define the term already in a way and i but of course it is quite difficult and i think that is something which i also thought about what would you then call it would you then call it change social change what is the difference between innovation and change and if there is no, and I think that sometimes in innovation theory it's discussed whether it's incremental or radical or whether it's um, this or that object of innovation and is this innovation or is it not? Because if you don't have the word of innovation, then a whole field of research loses the object of study. <laughs> and that could <laughs> create kind of a crisis. <laughs> 
in a way, <laughs> if it's just change. <laughs> um, but I'm, I think I'm much more into trying to actually engage with competing for uh, having a say in defining this uh, concept. Also because it is powerful. And I don't know if that is a legitimate research interest, but it is powerful and it has some really uh, clear political implications. So just turning your back on it, in a way, I don't know if that is the most responsible thing to do. Um, and the, if, we, if we really think that innovation, one thing is that with Schumpeter, it gets closely connected to uh, competition and to uh, economic development and to capitalism, which is, of course, not with Schumpeter, but starting with, with Marx, uh, that it's closely connected to capitalism. Um, then it's, it's not that old. It's really, I think that I prefer to look at it as something which is open and something th that we can still try to define. Uh, and the other question about the sim, I'm not sure, is it, what is it in module three that you think is falling into this? Oh, no, I just thought that then yeah. having, having set up this social innovation as to yeah. some extent a much broader and um, you know, socially mm. responsible way to think about change. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great story in the first year to uh, yeah. brought students in based on what I would call the discourse of social enterprise in terms of in, in, in this kind of innovation, yeah. having radicalized them slightly, yeah. having given them an alternative for social innovation, but then sort of drifted back, as, and again, there is no alternative, but to drift back into teaching them to run existing institutions that are more or less beholden to the capitalist mode of production. You know? It's not radical in that sense. Let them manage utopia. But even really, even utopia gets defined by profit and, <laughs> and, and bottom lines and so forth. I think it's, a, it's, it's just a, it's a problem. Some people in development studies now only use the word development in quotation marks. Okay. Uh, because it's not development. It's something else that may be good or bad. But it's not development because yeah. development's already been appropriated in a certain way. I yeah. wonder what would happen in this field. If you wrote articles and just had in, in innovation in, in quotation marks, because you didn't accept the word, I can see that you, you need to work with the word because there is yeah. no alternative. That's 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 the whole point of a of a, a lazy discourse. You can't escape the terminology, but you can start to destabilize it. Yeah. yeah. But is the problem perhaps with the with the third module that just like could say in in so far as we call it innovation and we want to make use of innovation then we have these alternatives of um, methods to use but even though we have a lot of other uh, ways of um, facilitating change processes in participatory ways that are just not called innovation mm -hmm. so maybe like managing managing innovation or entrepreneurship or saying that we develop entrepreneurial skills we don't have the alternative terminology and approaches have may not have been developed yet so that all we can look to may be some of these that you call sure, no, described in but still, if you say entrepreneurial skills and teaching entrepreneurship and how to become an entrepreneur, even though whether you will be a social entrepreneur or a, mm. just a commercial entrepreneur, some of the skills or some of the things that you may want to do or some of the competences may be the same. But there is something else also in social entrepreneurship. Um, that we may define in different ways as a social conscience or as Danielson or as um, responsibility mm -hmm. or but the thing about making things happen and thinking about how to make things happen in certain contexts, reading your 
environment and making use of it in the best way. These may be generic skills for different kinds of entrepreneurs. And I think being more aware of that could be a way to solve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what's that? Thank you, Louise, for a I think very good lecture. Thank you. Presentation, you know, um, stimulating, uh, you know, and critical, you know, offering us some of your thoughts and concepts. Um, I would like to uh, to discuss a little bit further uh, some of your own, which is a nice way of doing self critique, which I, I like a lot. I, you said. Could you please find the, the slide? Yeah. The, that's the one in which you, you talk about the agents and the, the, the public employees and their... The one with the... Um, yeah, let's see. With uh, uh, mm. false consciousness? <laughs> um, the, the one in which you criticize your position. Uh, <coughs> this one. <coughs> uh, yeah. 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 Yes, and what I would like for you to, to further develop or talk a little bit about would be, um, you know, or I don't know if you know, but you know, many of us at this department are very interested in, you know, the learner's perspective, the perspectives by the subjects, the individuals, be it professional staff, be it users, be it citizens, you know, in many, many formats and positions. So I thought it would be interesting, I mean, as far as I understand, your also the definition of your of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the innovation in a kind of a public framing, it, it is generalized at a certain level. It has a yeah. meta yeah. horizon, I think, uh, and it has very good, I think, you know, um, definitions, you mm -hmm. know. But I was wondering, how would you see um, the, uh, your definition or your critical approach ability to open up for um, including uh, these ideas, values, everyday life, and utopian ideas by the involved agents, um, and also the emancipatory. I mean, have you worked with that? I mean, how would you see, is it possible uh, to include, even though you have a, a meta kind of uh, definition? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I do think that it is possible. And um, if I find the definition, uh, One way, first of all, you could say this, even though I have the definition, the terms are not necessarily that well defined. And you could say, I could ask, of course, the people in the organization, whether they would actually, of course, I could discuss it with them. Yeah. and also make them define what, is, what does political concern mean in this particular context mm -hmm. and especially citizen rights citizen rights okay. this is something it could be they are so different in all the encounters if I say the rights are actualized in the encounter between the citizen and the state or state uh, institution or organization that it is the encounter the, the right is only an efficient right when it actually makes a difference to the per person yeah. who has a right. Yeah. Just having a right on paper. It doesn't make any difference if you don't f feel that this right actually gives you any uh, capacities or freedom or anything. So I would say that in order to, this one is very broad, mm. but still in, in a school or in a public authority, in the police, in a prison, all these things would be very, very different things. Mm -hmm. And also, what is, for instance, the suggestion I had about the right to due process. It's actually quite important whether the citizen feel intimidated or alienated by the authority, because that actually weakens. Even though they may have a perfect bureaucracy that works perfectly well and treats every case the same way, if the citizen doesn't dare to make complaints or ask questions, then this right is just not very mm. well developed. So I, th yeah. I think that it, yeah. it could, and I would hope that in the future, that would be the way that I would have uh, opportunities to work with. Of course, but you know, when you look at it, yeah. like, we, like, like yeah. we do right here, you could say that uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the acting, acting agent, also semantic, yeah. would be sector organizations, public sector organizations, yeah. Yeah. because you refer back and you're talking about their capa capacity yeah. uh, to blah, blah, blah. And of course, and also you talk about new practices, but of course, clearly they're made by human beings, yes. and yeah, public yeah, sector yeah. organizations are made by human beings in all their mm -hmm. variety and com competence and skills, yeah. etc. Et yeah. et so, of course, I mean, yeah. um, these yeah. are not entities coming out from nowhere. No, no, no. Yeah. But I can see the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, <coughs> thank you for a very inspiring lecture. Um, I was a bit um, maybe provoked by you saying that there are no studies that take it to the test or take it all the way when you compare mm -hmm. or link innovation with uh, empowerment. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe justice and actually try to fill out what is this social value mm -hmm. and for whom. Mm -hmm. um, because at least in some parts of the social innovation literature there are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know what Lars knows about it and maybe Linda as well. Um, this uh, Belgian professor, Frank Muller, has been working a lot with actually engaging in the discourse of the fights about what is this yeah. term supposed yeah. to mean. Yeah. And this is the, in his definition, yeah. uh, it's about to enhance the basic human needs for the less well off. Yeah. It's about the participatory parity, it's yeah. about social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says that social innovation is supposed to be linked uh, with the bottom of society, actually. And it's both yeah. as a discourse of human fight. It's also a good yeah, way yeah. to gain money from the European funding, yeah, yeah. because social innovation is very yeah. high on yeah. the, uh, And it's also actually uh, headlines of a lot of empirical studies. Um, so it's trying to take it to the test, not alone, but in, yeah. in, uh, as a head of a, a large European uh, research network. So there are openings. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he would, uh, he would also be the one, if I, if I myself su should suggest one, who actually goes furthest. Mm -hmm in defining, and also who is most, in a way, political, uh, in the sense that he, he, has, he is the one who, def who, who define, had, from whom I had this idea of collective autonomy, mm. or political autonomy, or, and he also is the one who says that the state still has, he's not the only one, but he insists that the state has a very important role also in yeah, protecting yeah, citizen rights. Of yeah. It. And it's not a matter of slimming the state, it's, yeah. just, it's the total opposite. Yeah. That but the state is supposed yeah. to enhance and create yeah. the, the frameworks yeah. for these. So it's not a matter of much or, or less state. No. no, no, no. So there are. No, it's not a zero sum. No, no, then that. <laughs> of course, you can okay. criticize this position for a lot of stuff. It's, it's highly normative. Uh, but at, it, it, it supplies you with some kind of direction in this minefield. Uh, mm. And it's actually a, an ongoing battle for him for like 15 or 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, at yeah. least on the European level. But I still think he's a little hesitant when you actually but ask him. But even if you read the he, empirical he studies like done I, by I people couldn't. that are inspired by this way of thinking, you know, there are yeah. case studies across the uh, European scale at least, uh, which is worth looking into. Yeah. Also it's a, it's a, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice. Thank you, Louise. I like your lecture very much. Um, I enjoy very much your way of linking philosophy, sociology, and uh, innovation studies. <coughs> I'm, I'm looking very much forward to collaborate with you and also follow your own uh, research. I think it is very important. Uh, I just have uh, one uh, additional question to the others. Uh, the the gen genealogy of uh, innovation, you uh, you say it's a mis misunderstanding to treat Schumpeter as sort of founding father of entrepreneurship and innovation studies, and it, it, I, I, I would probably agree with that. But referring back to uh, Mullard, he, he says that the, the notion of social innovation is actually rather new, mm -hmm. uh, but, but uh, <coughs> it should be linked to uh, to older studies, Max Weber's uh, studies of social change, Marx's, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I totally agree with that. But when you talk about um, the notion, it, it should be older than, uh, than these guys. Uh, did, I, did I understand that correctly? The, that, that 
that you have actually uh, tracked the notion of innovation uh, I far back in time, not linked to other notions of social change or Weber studies of the uh, relation between Protestant sects and then the evolution of capitalism and so on and so forth, but, but, but as a notion, it, it is actually older. It is. It's, uh, okay. it's not me who tracked it down. It no. is this guy, uh, Benoit, Benoit yeah. Coutin, who tracked it down. Yes, and he also uh, has other ex where he says that. But, but what is a little maybe <coughs> unclear about the way he does it is that he looks at innovation also as innovation and innovation and invention and related categories, so to yeah, say, so, uh, so and see mm -hmm. how they develop from mm -hmm. through time. But he, he points to other research fields, such as sociology and anthropology, who have actually taken up the term innovation and used the term innovation, for instance, as a term for cultural change. And that is something parallel to Schumpeter, but just not the definition that gained dominance, in a way. But this could have okay. been the one. That, yeah. So okay. that is what he and he says that the Schumpeter that I think many people say that that Schumpeter's idea of innovation is actually something he builds on from Marx. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have two comments. One uh, yeah. explicitly related to your uh, talk that I think it's more suggested that it would be very interesting. Uh, for all of us to discuss this concept of critique a little further. You, um, you mentioned that Butler has this distinction between critique and judgment. And I think if you go back to uh, Butler Benjamin, mm -hmm. then you'll find that his notion of critique that develops throughout his uh, thinking, uh, in fact, has a, an understanding of critique as non-judging, mm -hmm. but as this kind of critique is not uh, separated from judgment, but it's more a kind of critique preparing the ability to judge, yes. so that some the criteria of judgment also grows out of the critique. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is mm -hmm. the, the concept of critique that is the base of Adorno, I think. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. then you sh couldn't just divide it as Papa does. Uh, no, no. But I think it's, it, but this yeah. is very broadly spoken, but I think it would be interesting mm -hmm. for us uh, yeah. to discuss mm -hmm. further because yes. there are so many concepts of critique and mm -hmm. uh, not the question of defining one or the other, mm -hmm. but finding out what are the yeah. abilities yes. of different yeah. kinds of critique. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's just a, a thought and yeah. brought this up, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, suggestion to continue the discussion. Thanks. Then uh, yeah. I have a, a remark uh, related to what uh, Stephen said, and I think that the, I think it's rather complicated, maybe more than you uh, accept. A word is but a word, and you could uh, interpret it in different ways, of course. And should we use innovation, should we skip it, as uh, Stephen might suggest, or, ah, uh, sorry, or should we uh, fight for the right interpretation of it? Mm -hmm. And I think this goes for all concepts, more or less. You have this the dialectics of uh, enlightenment that uh, goes through all the concepts that we use. Uh, that goes for development too, and mm -hmm. autonomy, and uh, yeah, anything. So in this sense, I agree that uh, you shouldn't just leave the concepts to those that now have the power to define them. But at the other side, but not all concepts are worth fighting for. Some of them might be uh, uh, substituted. And I'm, I, I myself do not use the concept of innovation. And I thought of when innovation or these things uh, deal with experiencing, I would say I would never, and nobody I think would have the idea of talking about innovating your experiences. But you might renew your, or your experiences might be new or become you. Mm. And uh, that's, of course, not an mm. argument, but uh, a, a reflection. And I think that innovation today is very, very much powerful. And you know that, uh, that Bob Jessup has written a book, and he calls this period for the Schumpeterian uh, welfare state. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's why 
that's because the innovation concept is at the center of more or less uh, most of these uh, initiatives that uh, is closely related to neoliberalism. And at least, mm -hmm. at least I would say, this Im implies very, very deep contradictions within the concept. And uh, mm -hmm. you have to fight a lot to free the concept from that. I wouldn't say you shouldn't do that, you mm -hmm. couldn't do it. Of course, uh, this doesn't make sense that you have a veto on using it, but you, uh, I think it's, it's mm -hmm. more difficult. The development uh, concept is, I don't know, I think that uh, maybe you think of the, the, the what's this book, The Development uh, uh, Dictionary, that uh, Wolfgang Sachs edited uh, some 20, 30 years ago, and which was written by uh, critical theorists, post structuralists and, and others. And this shows that this uh, agenda, political agenda of development was raised uh, and put at the center shortly after the Second World War mm. uh, by uh, the American president at that time. And uh, that it was uh, written tightly into a new imperialist agenda, uh, as they see it. And of course, development is a much older world and much broader, so I haven't just given up talking about development, but we have to, uh, to consider that development in a societal yeah. sense is just as ambiguous, at least, as uh, somehow. So it just just a reflection mm -hmm. that yes. uh, I don't know whether it's so uh, productive to, or what if productive could also be to talk about uh, and, uh, ins in insisting in using innovation. Okay. But uh, I, I agree that when you are within this field, mm. of course, then you uh, maybe leave the field too early by not using the, the concepts at all. That uh, is always a discussion. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's uh, an innocent concept. I think very, very loaded at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not innocent at all. No. But yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I agree, it's not innocent. <laughs> you didn't say that. No, no, no. 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 <coughs> I, I, I totally agree. But but how to avoid it? I mean, <laughs> I, I just I just uh, I just had another if thought beyond. I said okay. You couldn't avoid it. No, listen, <laughs> uh, enterprise, <laughs> enterprise, enterprise yeah. is maybe even more loaded and less yeah. innocent yeah. Uh, because enterprise today is totally uh, colonized by a neoclassical understanding of uh, the economy. Coming back to the notion of economy is totally even more loaded than enterprise because we have an extremely narrow conventional understanding of economy, meaning that there's only one type of enterprise. In, so it, it is a kind of self regulating. I like the idea of critical uh, innovation studies. I think that is a, a wonderful uh, uh, notion that I'll buy into. Uh, because just like we need more than ever critical uh, economy studies, critical enterprise studies, yeah. because um, like we Weber said, it, it's very difficult for us born into the wheels of modernity to escape those wheels. But we totally need more than ever critical analysis of it. So we also want an Oxford handbook mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. critical innovation mm -hmm. studies. There's one Sorry. on social innovation. The handbook on social the innovation. One yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. critical innovation studies. But this is filled with critical innovation studies. Yeah, but it, the, the, they call themselves. Uh, I'm not saying that there are no um, critical, no, but, but it's just not the term. It's there. Yeah, it is. Okay, so I think it's written in the name of critique, but it's open to discussion. How much is critical there? I'm not saying that it's that the studies are not critical. They just don't call themselves critical with large or capital letters. Yeah. yeah. Stephen? I think if that field doesn't exist, I agree. This is a rare time when I'll agree with the flowers. This is this is a great opening for, for this department. Know, to, be, to be trying to found and to establish that as, as the way to work within the terminology, but to try and fill it with a completely different value set. Uh, 
I, I agree. Not all words are worth fighting for, but occasionally, if you don't take the fight, then you're completely excluded, and that's not going to concern anybody in, in, in the positions of power. Innovation is not going to go away for at least this generation. Um, and university courses in particular are more and more um, requiring to have that innovation that as, a, as, a, as an orientation. So I like the idea of critical innovation studies rather than social innovation that there's already an exist, existing field which we're quite well connected to. My only concern is that that will, by definition, has to be marginalized from the main field of innovation studies. And you know, this is one of the few departments in one of the few universities in the world that has as its mission this, this notion, of some, some different notion of critique. And that, that is a tremendous way to, to frame what we do with this academic field. There's a lot of potential.